All right. Thank you for having me in the wonderful city of Munich. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about the human brain. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I'm going to talk about the future of it and the past of it. So to Plato and Aristotle and Herophilus, uh, they were in search for where is the soul. That's over a 1,000 years ago. And they decided that the soul is distributed between three compartments. The heart, the gut, and the brain. 1,000 years later, we're still asking the same questions and trying to identify it. Now, let's see where is my clicker. Is that the, there you go. Um, I started my journey academically as a mathematician and then later in life decided that there's something greater than just doing abstract uh, thinking and decided to get into uh, neuroscience and what is the human brain. It's a fascinating uh, enigmatic uh, organ. Looks the same, structurally the same everywhere, but produces different functions and exhibit lots of variations of behaviors. If we are to take the vessels inside the brain and extend them, it would be from here to the moon, and possibly back. As I am saying, the different variations of the brain configuration now, uh, probably the science changes and the facts changes with it. My goal today is to actually present to you with um, how we are actually going to interface to that brain, uh, the mapping of these structures, some initiatives that we're doing where we're mapping these structures to turn the brain neurons into something like Google Earth. And how we manipulate these structures and augment uh, the brain capacity, either when it's plagued by a disorder or we just simply want to augment our capacity. Uh, our initial approach uh, is generally been toward uh, uh, trying to uh, facilitate corrections for neurological disorders. But in order to get there, we need a theoretical framework. And the theoretical framework that we subscribe to is referred to as the fundamental code unit. Everybody knows Morse code? Well, almost. Um, as simple as it may be, it's a very simple combination that creates a huge variation. Similar to the genetic code, uh, we have very few characters, and then they produce uh, various variations. So the theoretical framework that we uh, subscribe to, the fundamental code unit, suggests that on the basic uh, brain uh, physical layer, there is a communication that takes place between individual neurons. And we suggest that that happens in something called unitary mathematics, which I will not get into, uh, so nobody, <laughs> no math phobias. Um, and uh, it is able to communicate uh, bursts of information uh, that is very large in quantity and um, in a very efficient manner. But this efficiency inherently comes from uh, something else. Uh, we suggest that that's uh, the fact that the brain is actually an optical machine and not just an electrical or chemical machine. So this is the concept of how the, uh, um, how the uh, old Morse uh, code works. In such a way, we basically have a substrate that is producing an assembly language that everything that is built on the top of it, including your higher functions like speaking and other faculties, uh, actually can be ciphered all the way back to the assembly language and thus, and thus can be computed. So at some point in time, I suggested that you can cure everything with light, right? How is that so? Before we get in how is that so, which we will later in the slides, we, I want to organize your thinking into people that want to have a quantitative self and people that want to have the research of the augmented self. It goes back to a lot of the talks that we had earlier when people are uh, utilizing areas in AI and whatnot uh, to uh, advance discovery uh, of how do I find 
uh, my behavior from market to whatever and is basically based on the things that you're exhibiting outward. So we find that in today's available technologies, things that you wear, technologies that you walk on, uh, things that you say, and when you collect all this information and you validate it against things from uh, uh, things like MRI and fMRI, which is uh, imaging machines, the big gigantic imaging machines for the brain, uh, and you conduct analysis, you're able to understand something. And that's something we refer to as the second concept of this talk, which is the brain code. Uh, the brain code is some pattern that the brain is giving me, or, an, or a, a, a small region of the brain is giving me to tell me that I'm healthy or I am suffering from this or that, and then for us to identify these things. So sort of like signals, like the car telling you, you have error code number one, error code number one equal X, right? And the second concept or category is augmented self. So how do I take certain type of technology and by wearing this technology or by being participant of this technology, I augment my capacity and my being. So for that, we designed two things. We designed a thing called the Brain OS, the Brain Operating System, and we designed a device called the Kiwi. And then we're going to discuss both. First, let's start with the operating system. Biggest problem in today's computing and deep learning and all that stuff is that you use uh, GPUs, you use power, okay? So for those of us who are not into computing, let's think of mobile devices and computers like that, they use CPU power, very low power, although it's still a lot. And then big computing and big data, you're using GPUs, uses a lot of power, and it's too expensive, right? So we had to come up with an operating system that matches the brain. The brain does a lot of uh, processing and a huge cognitive throughput, yet it uses 40 watts. How is that possible? So we mimic that in an operating system we refer to as the brain OS. The brain OS has a, a unique attributes that it follows actually the brain. And the brain OS was designed specifically to interface with a device that referred to as a Kiwi, which we'll learn to after. This is some data that tells you that this thing that we came up with, in fact, actually has the efficiency. We are, uh, if I have a laser, I would point basically on, a, on our uh, DSCNN was a genetic algorithm where about uh, orders of magnitude of factors against natural language processing and genetic algorithms in the DNN uh, by the point, the point zero five seven. You can use it for various things, but we're not going to cover them because it's, it's basically what is referred to as horizontal AI. Um, and uh, the world is going into vertical AIs. Uh, we are basically defying that and going into horizontal AI by basically giving you something that you can use when you um, know nothing about AI and you don't want to be bothered with a lot of uh, complicated concepts in there. Right. So that's the architecture and we won't be laboring it, but it actually learns from the World Wide Web. It learns from the environment out there. And um, if I give each one of you an operating system, not a single one of the operating systems will be the same after you turn it on. It actually learns from you. We used it in some wellness cases. We used it in some security cases. But these are uh, uh, irrelevant to discuss in relation to this, because what I want you to focus on is a device called the Kiwi. Everybody asks me why you call it the Kiwi. I call it the Kiwi because it designed after the Kiwi, the actual fruit. One of the most difficult things is to have a Hermetic encapsulation that is similar um, and accepted by the brain, not rejected by the brain. So a little bit of background. The Kiwi combines two concepts in human-machine interface. It, com it combines DBS, deep brain stimulation, with BMI, brain-machine interface. What does that mean? The whole business of neuromodulation revolves around having a small pulse-generated device that is placed in the chest cavity. Then they do a surgery uh, through craniotonomy, and you'll see some pictures of that uh, soon, uh, and placing electrodes into the brain, into the region that you have an interest to correct, and 
pulse generate uh, at a particular frequency to alter the electrophysiology and get the person back into a correction. You can see the size of it. Um, it's been used for uh, various conditions, chronic pain, depression, polymia nervosa, OCD, uh, Parkinson, and so forth, and some small trials um, in um, uh, Alzheimer and whatnot. Uh, this is how they look, and that's what's available on the state of the art. Uh, they're about the size of this device, and it goes in your chest cavity or some other areas that's available to house it, and then the wires and whatnot. Very inconvenient, a lot of infection, and uh, generally speaking, they don't work for long. A battery needs to be replaced. And to my earlier colleague that speaks about security, they are hackable. You can actually hack that device. So that tells you about the state of the art and uh, Summit in a nutshell. And it looks like this. Uh, when you look at the first image, that's the frame, the frame mounting. And this is the uh, actual surgery. It's quite barbaric. Um, but it is as good as it gets as far as what's available today. So we said, no, that's not good enough. If the brain is an optical machine, then I'm able to actually program every single cell to on and off state, meaning I can actually use the, this, the, the actual neuronal structure as a transistor, as a biological computer inside the brain. And from that, able to turn on or off a particular state of disease or disorder and make the person better. But how do I get to an optical brain, considering that the only thing that is optical is the retina rod, which is the eyes, and the system that actually connects to the eyes? We do that by a process called optogenetics. And optogenetics is basically to modify the actual neuron so that the neuron can actually be photosensitive. So we re-express the actual neuron. And the simple way to put it is that we marry a protein segment to uh, a neuron, causing that neuron to be optically sensitive, and then flash a light on that neuron, thereby turning it on or off. It's, I'm it's oversimplifying it. It's not an easy thing to get to the brain and actually do all the things that I'm saying. Um, but in a few minutes, we'll get to how that is possible. So the solution is that we designed this thing, the Kiwi, with a chip uh, that is about the size of a grain of rice. And essentially, it combines uh, two systems. One is a sensory system, and one is a processing system. And the two together work in concerto to actually achieve the objectives that we talked about, which is turning on or off a particular neuronal circuit and modifying it. When it's lodged, it is lodged in a particular region of interest. Uh, like in Parkinson, we put it in the subsalamic nucleus and actually uh, modulate the optogenetical uh, component if it's needed, or just do the uh, uh, electrophysiological manipulation, which is sending a small current of, uh, of power to modify the behavior of this area of neurons. It's made out of a, uh, the blue thing that you're seeing is carbon nanotubes, which is an, quite an interesting material that the brain happens to, or the neurons happen to like. The brain does not like many things and actually rejects them and actually phagocytes them or eat them and just becomes uh, highly irritated when you put the wrong type of material in. We also come up with ways to uh, propagate higher number of neurons and higher numbers of channels so we're starting from 10,000 up to a million, as opposed to the existing state of the art is only addressing uh, uh, tens of thousands of neurons um, uh, at a one flush, meaning that it's not one-to-one -one correspondence with the res resolution. It's not exactly corresponding, very, very high. And then we come up with a platform to charge this inductively, uh, meaning that you actually uh, drive the electricity through wireless, uh, similar to like we do it with, uh, with iPhone and whatnot. This is the size of the state of the art. This is the size of our chip. And this is the size of our propagator, which controls some parts of the elements of the chip and whatnot. 
Um, I'll fast forward on this uh, so that I can give you a chance to also ask me questions. And um, this technology uh, is quite fascinating because, as I said earlier, it combines the, the deep brain stimulation function with a brain machine interfaces function, meaning that I can stimulate record and then also be able to do things like um, uh, project information on the virtual cortex or on the language area and whatnot. Okay, more on the technology and the algorithms and whatnot. It's broken into three tier architecture. It has a lot of security features. The three tier architecture allows you to actually manipulate your own brain from a mobile device. I know it sounds like uh, futuristic, but it is actually there. This is the size of the chip as it existed several months ago. Now it's about one eighth the size of this um, because we've been shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. This is the overall system. So the person would have basically something like an earbud. In the earbud, there's a three positions EEG, five various sensors that looks at body temperatures, et cetera, and is able to be a charge way uh, point to the actual uh, chip. The chip itself ha gets lodged in the area of interest uh, where you actually want to uh, correct the problem. So imagine a future where you don't have a computer, but you are actually able to project your thought, do the query, and the query gets sent back and is actually in your brain, the response. So direct interface between you and what is so-called the World Wide Web. Imagine if I'm able to actually turn off your state of PTSD or depression in one session as opposed to 20 years of tablets or pills, which is the state of the art today. Or have a person with Parkinson walk in for the surgery who cannot actually walk uh, or get strolled with the, to the surgery and then walk out on her feet uh, handling everything uh, properly. Decoding the language of the brain and having health. Uh, I'm wondering if we can actually play these two videos. Um, but since I don't have a control of this, uh, one patient have uh, this kinesic dystonia, which is a young lady. And Can you try and hold them right out in front of you? I know that's difficult. Just see what, woo! See if you can. Yeah, it is very hard, I know. That's really good. Can you hold your arms straight out for me and show me how wide those fingers are going? That's fantastic. Keep going. She has since gone on to be um, a lovely nurse and uh, a great person. And any time you turn off the system, she would go back to what you saw earlier. Um, can you play the gentleman? This is Parkinson case. And what you're going to see now, he's going to be reaching for a telemetry device, remote control essentially, pointed to the DPS and turn off the trimmer. like magic. So you're going to hear a lot of things about AI, and you're going to have people that want to make a machine like a human and a human like a machine, and it gets really confusing. Um, all what we're trying to do is to basically restore human dignity and give people the ability to uh, get back what's taken away from them, either by evolution or by other process. Thank you very much, and I'll let you ask any questions.